And now I'm talking to Niall Crowley from Claiming Our Future. Niall, how's it going? Could you tell us a bit about uh, t- today? Um, uh, what's basically what's happening today here in the RDS? I suppose t- today is very much about setting goals <coughs> and identifying what our priorities might be for those goals. Goals that would be relevant to Ireland, but also goals that would be relevant to a wider world. And I hope and we hope, I think, that w- what we might come up with is a set of goals based on clear values, equality, environmental sustainability, participation. Can we translate those values into concrete goals? And then I suppose the next step after today is to bring those conclusions from today into the international debate that's going on as to what should succeed the Millennium Development Goals so that there would be universal goals coming out of the UN that Ireland would be bound to and that would create a better Ireland. Uh, Could you tell us a bit about uh, Claiming Our Future? Claiming Our Future tries to draw together people from trade unions, environmental groups, cultural groups, global justice groups, community groups um, and to do so I suppose to think through alternatives to the current situation and to to build the message that there is an alternative to what we're going through, to build the policies and, and strategies that might form part of that alternative and to empower civil society in bringing forward and demanding that alternative. And are you interested, your your focus, we're talking about the, the Millennium Development Goals now but are, are we is there anything about Ireland as well? Like you know what I mean. Well, what they say in terms of the, the the goals that will succeed the Millennium Development Goals will be universal goals that will have a relevance to richer and poorer nations, and I think that's right because the 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 links and relationships between the richer nations and the poorer nations need 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 to change. Therefore. Poorer nations obviously need to change and, and, and become stronger and, and uh, higher standard of living, but also the richer nations need to change so that you have greater equality in the richer nations, so you have a greater global justice, but also so that you have social justice within these countries. And could you tell us a bit about uh, the programme for today? Well, there's four bits to the programme. We'll start by talking about Ireland and the issues that Ireland faces and what international goals could say to those issues. We'll then talk about the world (coughs) and the global issues that that confront us uh, and what sort of goals might serve a better world or a more just world. And then in the afternoon, we'll move into sort of very concrete deliberation in terms of what would our five priority goals be uh, to bring into the UN process. And then secondly, what could we do to advance those goals as individuals and as members of organisations? Okay, I'll be talking to other people during the day anyway. Thanks very much, Nat. Thank you. And now I'm talking to Ivan Cooper, uh, Director of Advocacy with uh, The Wheel. Ivan, how's it going? Um, Ivan, um, we've had two sessions out of the three so far. The session one just finished there. Uh, are, are there Are there many good points and thoughts being generated today, do you think? Yeah, there are loads of good thoughts being developed. The uh, discussion at the table has been really good, you know. Uh, for too long, these Millennium Development Goals have been thought about as, as only having applicability, you know, in developing countries or in what used to be called the third world and stuff like that. But in actual fact, uh, the goals still have relevance in Ireland here for many people uh, uh, who don't have access to uh, uh, good quality health services or who can't access uh, 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 good educational outcomes for themselves and, and people who live in poverty in Ireland. But aside from that, what's after coming out of the sessions is uh, a general sense that we should have new goals uh, for all of humanity. Uh, for Ireland and and, and and for people in the whole world uh, that are basically uh, uh, structured around identifying what people need to flourish in their lives you know we're all human beings we all have similar needs shouldn't we all have the same kind of an, uh, a chance to to thrive and, and flourish in our personal lives and what our uh, the group at our table identified was we need to define what those things are what is it that a flourishing human being um, should have access to uh, and then we need to make sure that we structure our, our society in such a way that people can can have access to the things that they need to lead full and, 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 and fulfilled lives. So it's been a really inspiring uh, morning so far. I'm talking to Sorley Makahio, Christian Aid. Sorley, how's it going? Uh, could you tell us a bit about your organisation, please? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> obviously, I know you're Christian. <laughs> well, uh, we can come back to that. But yeah. Christian Aid, is it's a development organisation that... Um, works in about 50 odd countries around the world at any any one time. Um, What maybe distinguishes us from other agencies is that we look at the structural causes of poverty. So while we do have a humanitarian department that you know responds to humanitarian crises as they arise, our primary focus is on the structural issues that are cause poverty and prolong people's um, position within poverty so 
by that I mean things like climate change, an unfair financial system, trade laws, things like that that really have a profound impact on people's ability to get out of poverty. You're doing a lot of work at the moment, aren't you? Or have been for the last few years, I don't know how long, but on uh, uh, multinationals and other big companies avoiding tax in development countries, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, one of our, that's our major priority at the moment and has been, as you say, for a few years. The focus is really on um, the lack of transparency that enables large multinationals who have a presence in poor countries to avoid paying tax in those countries and shift them out to tax havens around the world where they record the high profits in the tax havens and thereby don't pay any tax anywhere. Uh, That money, if it was taxed at an appropriate level, in those developing countries would have a profound impact on countries' ability to get dependent and move away from a reliance on aid, which is ultimately what any development agency should be doing, but isn't always articulated by development agencies. They don't often have the, they don't often know how they're going to get away from contributing aid in the long run. So that would be one of the structural things that we work on. And how's your work on this going? Are you getting any results, like any positivity? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to, to I think it would be fair to say that we have put the issue of tax avoidance uh, by multinationals on the agenda in Ireland. And uh, we've certainly been able to capitalise on the massive exposure of the issue in, in Britain, where all this stuff around Starbucks and Amazon and Google has been uh, in the papers for the last little while. I think you'll see now in the G8, there is a commitment to looking at the issue of aggressive tax avoidance by multinationals on the agenda. What will come out of that remains to be seen. Um, It's certainly on the agenda of the G20. Uh, We saw a statement coming out of the G20 just last night where they're committing to look, or they're committing to something called automatic information exchange, which basically means that countries will exchange tax-related information automatically with each other. That kind of information gives countries the data they need to identify where and if tax dodging has been taking place. So from our perspective, things are going very well. On the other hand, um, I say in tandem with that, we're, we're in dialogue with the large multinationals. We're trying to address the, uh, the kind of the, uh, the philosophy or the atmosphere that they feel is appropriate to engage in in tax avoidance. Trying to address that, you know, say, look, engaging in aggressive tax avoidance is actually putting your own company at risk. It's reputational risk, and it's also risk for your investors if they don't have a full picture of what you're doing. And that's actually going very well as well. It's maybe a different approach to those agencies who want to name and shame. This is the one saying, look, we have to recognize that multinationals are a big player. And what do we want to do? Do we want to name and shame them? which gets you so far, or do we want to engage them in dialogue and find a common way where we can help them to get to a point where they are still making profit, but doing it in a responsible way? And that's a Christian thing to do, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, the the Christian and Christian aid, I mean, I should say that, I mean, you don't have to be Christian to work for, for Christian aid. You don't have to be Christian to benefit from Christian aid. We work with people of all faiths and none. The Christian and Christian aid is that we are driven by, you know, what it says in uh, Christianity, that you're supposed to tackle injustice where you see it. You're supposed to work on behalf of the poor. That's what the Christian and Christian aid is. And I think um, that's a very powerful, motivating so you're, drive. You're, so you're not a re- religious organisation? No, we're not a proselytising. We're not, you know, uh, an agency that goes around trying to convert people. That's not our game. We don't believe it's right to do that. We don't believe it's right to try to take advantage of people who are vulnerable to push a particular religious message. We are very much not an evangelical organisation. Absolutely not. Okay, and uh, are you enjoying the conference so de- today? And have you have you uh, been hearing much interesting talk uh, to the tables? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think no matter what comes out, no matter what specific outcomes come out of this conference, the fact that people from the domestic sector and from the international sector are here looking at shared issues is a really significant landmark for tackling injustice globally. Um, This is the first time that something like this has happened in this this kind of setting. Um, And I am hugely encouraged by that. We'll have heard, you'll have heard inside people talking about issues of shared concern and that's the way the world is today global injustice issues of global injustice 
they don't know, they don't recognise borders. Climate change, it doesn't recognise borders. Financial, um, lack of financial transparency, it depends on a global system to operate. So they're the issues that affect everybody. If you're poor in one country, you have solidarity with poor no matter where the other other people are. So I think it's very encouraging what we're hearing in today. I think it's the first step in a really important process. Uh, it really is an historic uh, day, uh, conference here today, isn't it? Landmark yeah, I, I, I really believe so. I mean, I think, w I hope that we will look back in this moment in five years time and say, look where we've come from. That was an important step. We got those people together. Yes, the conversation was difficult at times and people weren't always able to find common ground. But look where we've come in those five years. I think it's going to prove to be that kind of uh, event. And now I'm talking to Sharon Kelly from Tear Fund Ireland. Sharon, how's it going? Sharon, could you tell us a bit about your organisation, please? Yes, Tear Fund Ireland. We've been operating in Ireland for the last number of years. We're a sister company to Tear Fund UK, although we're independent to them. And we work primarily in Africa and Asia among the most vulnerable, marginalised peoples and communities there. Um, we do a lot of work with forgotten children, um, issues around HIV and AIDS, and we also do some work in emergencies. How many countries do you work in, do you know? We work in approximately seven priority countries, and we have two particular countries that we work in that are Irish government funded, Malawi and Myanmar. And after that we work in Ethiopia, Uganda, Zambia, um, other countries uh, in Cambodia, um, so yeah, we have a good broad number of countries, but we have kept them focused at the same time. And do you have uh, many volunteers, or are you just uh, employee run? Or We have a small team of people in terms of employees, but we have volunteers all over the country. Um, we have approximately 40 volunteers, and they support basically advocating for the issues that we work hard towards, campaigning, fundraising, and practical things as well. They'll come in and they'll assist us in terms of packing envelopes and getting mailings out and so on. And how you find that uh, your, your organisation has a big interest, obviously, in your work and as part of uh, this movement to get new uh, development goals. How you find it, the conference today? The conference is really very timely and it's also very valuable to be a part of it. Um, really looking forward to post-2015 and what we should be focusing on going forward. And having worked in the Irish sector for 16 years, I find that it's really helpful in terms of ensuring that we take a global view on poverty and social exclusion and development. Um, so today to be able to contribute to that in some way is very meaningful and it's very inclusive. And I do hope that each participant feels that we have some influence in what policy may be in the future. In saying that, it's such a responsibility as well because it's important that we actually do um, influence policy and the decision makers in a way that we'll get the best result for both Ireland and global countries that we work in. And in terms of the two sessions out of the three we've had so far today, on the table you're sitting on, are there any new interesting thoughts coming up like? Um, I think I think a lot of it really. You don't have to tell us them all. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of anything new. I I think you know so, sometimes we we try to think that it's something new that we need to do, and in fact we have the answers. It's actually about doing something that's right and what's good. And a lot of what we were focusing on was having a focus on driving people's interests and not necessarily economic interests. Although the economy and economic development are important, that we should be putting people first. And now I'm talking to Sean Healy, Director of Social Justice Ireland. Sean, how's it going? Are you enjoying today, the conference today? Very much so, very much so. I think there's a very engaged group of people who are really serious about looking at uh, what the situation is in Ireland and, and uh, looking at uh, the Millennium Development Goals as they have been in place since, the year, for, since 2000, but looking at uh, our, uh, what needs to be done uh, in terms of, first of all, moving Ireland uh, and developing a, a, towards a kind of a sustainable future and developing some um, goals for Ireland and then I, I assume later in the day looking at um, options for Ireland in terms of the, uh, of the broader reality and what might be got in terms of uh, global development goals. And uh, has there been much talk in the first two uh, uh, sections of the conference about Ireland, like about the problems in Ireland and solutions? Because I know... The, the, the focus today is on a talk and discussion about solutions to problems, like, is, uh, and particularly about the, uh, uh, particularly like, uh, talking globally about the new development goals and all. But what about, Ar about Ireland? Like, uh, well, there's a lot of discussion in the group I'm in about uh, Ireland and about goals that we could set for Ireland 
that would be consistent with having a sustainable future for the world. And things that they're looking at would be, for example, uh, the need to introduce some kind of a basic income system where every man, woman and child on the planet has enough income to live life with dignity and moving towards that. The second thing they're talking about is how do we work, how do we guarantee that everybody can have meaningful work in a world where there aren't jobs for a lot of people and so there's part of the solution to that is recognizing that there's a lot of work done uh, that isn't actually paid jobs uh, but uh, but uh, uh, isn't paid employment but in fact is very much uh, useful work for example work done by carers work done by a lot of people volunteering in the community work done in the home work uh, f uh, in the family work done on their own personal development whether they're uh, Promote, uh, improving their education or writing poetry or whatever there's a huge amount of work being done that is meaningful and useful work but that isn't paid employment and isn't recognized as such so one of the things that we're talking about as well as putting a basic income in place going uh, moving to a situation where all work that is meaningful is actually recognized as meaningful work and uh, we move towards a situation where everybody has access to that that's brilliant. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed now I wasn't at your table. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I, I mean, we, we've got a, there's a very good group at the table and they're very involved with this uh, with this discussion, these discussions. Another thing they're talking about that would apply to Ireland and broader world is about equality and equality, like gender equality in particular, but also equality so that we don't have a, a, r a huge rich-poor divide or an urban-rural divide or a young-old divide. And there's uh, a, another component of the discussion is around rights and responsibilities and the need to balance both but also recognizing that rights have to go beyond um, just political rights and, and, and rights to, to, to sort of vote and citizenship rights that they have to go to social economic and cultural rights so that everybody will have uh, access to appropriate accommodation and um, essential education and, and uh, uh, the requirements for health care and so on and that people's cultures would be respected and that people would actually per be able to participate in shaping the future uh, a future that uh, they would if they're p part of shaping it and decide deciding what shape it should have then they'll take more responsibility for actually implementing what's required to deliver it so the issue about ensuring that there's good balance between rights and responsibilities in that context has been very well spelt out in the group as well so Social Justice Ireland are really a part of this uh, new movement for uh, the new um, for working uh, for all all of humanity, the new development goals. You're really part of it. Yeah? Yes, and, and to get global development goals will be very much uh, a part of our agenda. And uh, we are a part also of Claiming Our Future. We were one of the founding organisations and we will be very supportive and have been for quite a while, many years, supportive of, for example, the goal of DOCUS to raise Ireland's uh, uh, development aid to 0.7% of GDP or GNP as, as agreed by the United Nations. So. The, the organizations working together here and then on top of that uh, Social Justice Ireland itself uh, would be promoting these kinds of things and would has done so for quite some time because what we are in effect is a think tank an independent think tank but we're also a justice advocacy organization so we put the two together and uh, we have all we've produced a lot of material it's available on our website on socialjustice.ie anybody can have it they can download all our pers all our per publications for free and so on from that site as well now I'm talking to Mary Kyo from CBM Ireland. Mary, how's it going? Mary, could you tell us a bit about your organisation first, please? Yes, CBM Ireland is an organisation that's for people with disabilities in developing countries. We work in the area of inclusive development and we focus on the country of Congo. So we would work um, through partners with... Um, who would help and assist people with disabilities living in kind of conflict situations. And uh, are you an, an Irish national organisation or are you international? Or? Well, CBM Ireland is based in Ireland, but we are also part of a wider global organisation, which is CBM itself. So there is um, eight other organisations that would be in, um, I suppose, the, the western, western part of the world. And we would work with our um, development partners in, in the global south. Do you work in many countries? Is one? Um, work in over 72 countries, mm. yeah. Brilliant, yeah. And uh, how are you finding the day today? Enjoying it? 
I think the day is really good. Um, it's really useful to come together with colleagues and friends and the um, general public to talk about the global development framework. Um, people with disabilities in the original Millennium De Development Goals were not visible, so um, we're here to create visibility about disability in the future um, development framework as it evolves to make sure that it includes people with disabilities. And we've had two of the three sessions so far today the second one just finished there a few minutes ago uh how are you finding the actual sessions like are, are you, is there as a much are there, are there many good thoughts being points being made yes i mean there is there's a lot of good thought about how we can all work together globally for equality and social inclusion and that it's not just about um a small few people who have an interest or work in this area that this really should be about all citizens um being interested in people who are you know excluded from life due to a whole range of factors poverty um you know uh, discrimination and about how to bring about change so that that you know is is eradicated and now i'm talking to hans on we're director of docus at the end of this conference today hans how's it going hans uh, have you enjoyed the day and could you tell could you give us a, a summary up of the day and the main things that uh, we'll call it out today if you call please sure well first of all, I was amazed how many people showed up on a, the first sunny day Saturday of the year and they were willing to spend the day indoors to think with us about well what priorities should we be setting for Ireland and for a better world and I was amazed with the quality of the engagement that people showed and uh, we, we've we've gone through a long process we debated we discussed uh, we fought and we ended up uh, voting on a series of goals that we could set for Ireland, and uh, it's really amazing. Yeah, people came out with some of the, th you know, the the themes that we we weren't expecting in a way, but at the same time they were reflected in some of the things that people in Africa and Asia are telling us as well. And that you know the first priority that people want is is, is around uh, equality, the rule of law, uh, sustainable development, and you know. Um, and a different economy. Ultimately, what people are saying is, we want an economy that's for that works for people, and not just for profit. And I, I think that is a really big challenge now. Like, if we agree that that is a goal that we should work to, towards, and how do we do that? What is the step that w that we can take? And I think your listeners are a really, really important element in this because what we're talking about is is changing mindsets, changing the assumptions that we have about you know how we how our future will develop. Uh, and I think it's not, what we said today is, we can actually shape our own future. We don't have to inherit the future that is set out for us. We can make our own destiny. What's the next stage now in the development of uh, preparing for the next goal, development, international development goals? Yeah, well, the, um, we have a great opportunity. We have a need to do this sort of stuff. We need to discuss a, an alternative future for ourselves. But we also have a great opportunity. And that is that the UN is looking for suggestions of uh, a, you know, a new recipe for development, um, and a recipe that would apply to every country in this world. So, and the, op the other opportunity that we have is that Ireland currently holds the EU presidency, which means that we actually have more influence than we normally would have as a small country. And it's an opportunity that we should be using and seizing. Um, and so what we are saying is the next steps are, is that we will we'll be harvesting more and more suggestions from ordinary people in, in this country and from your listeners. If they log on to www.worldwewant.ie, they can leave their comments about what they think should be prioritized. And we will take those comments and uh, communicate those to the EU. There is a meeting in at the end of May of uh, European Foreign Affairs Ministers and we're going to try and influence that meeting. And with that then, we're also going to September in, in September to New York, to the United Nations, and we'll again say, well, look, the people of Ireland have been saying that these should be the priorities that we'd like to see reflected in our global you know, set of priorities. So those are very tangible steps. And I, I do think that it is really important that your listeners understand that we have this opportunity that um, and that we can speak out now and there is a real opportunity to be heard yeah and the uh, millennium goals for up till 2015 were they just for developing countries yeah one of the things that came out very strongly today is that people are saying the millennium development goals they were agreed in 2000 they were very useful because they were tangible measurable and all that stuff but there, there were a couple of flaws with them and one of them that it was really only for poor countries 
and rich countries all they needed to do if you will was to contribute the finances for the work of the the developing country governments and we're saying now that no this this new framework new, needs to be universal it needs to be based on human rights that came out very strongly it needs to address the inequality that exists within societies and between societies and it and particularly gender inequality that was mentioned very strongly um, and yeah we need to you know take those uh, priorities and work in a systematic way towards achieving them the current set of goals we've we've just under a thousand days left before they are to be achieved they can be achieved we've shown that it works um, and you know I, I would love it if your listeners can can help us uh, lobby for for those goals and, and very practically for a more and better development cooperation um, from the from Ireland but you know also then forward that we, we we agree this new framework and that we work together to to monitor it and to work towards the implementation of that framework as well yeah. and uh, could you just tell could you tell us what are the five main um results that came out today that are going to be brought to the EU uh, other ministers for finance yeah well as I said they were equality yeah. very strongly governance which means you know rules by which we make decisions yeah. uh, their sustainable development so the environmentally but also socially sustainable development uh, it rights human rights that the, that the decisions that we made are not just based on charity but are actually on people's rights and fifthly a non-exploitative economic system. So this, uh, what I was saying about an economy that works for people. So really, what it is saying is that people want uh, a government that they can trust and that is listening to them and that is um, including ordinary people in the decision making. What they want is um, that those decisions are based on rights and that we actually, as ordinary people, have a right to be included, mm. and that we we should reduce the inequality that is so much. Uh, blighting our, our societies. It, it's probably too early to think about now on, on, on the day we've just finished the conference but is would that work do you think like a new economic system like like uh, the, the only be uh, we, th- we have to be careful about how we kind of sell that. Yeah that, to me that was the great surprise of today yeah. that people saying well we need a new economic system I think that's a very easy thing to say but what does that mean in terms of articulating a goal I, I can see that that's a difficulty for us well, you know, I'd like to think in immeasurable practical steps and I will have to go back now with the other people that, that we met today and say, well, what does that mean? Yeah. How do we get to an economic system that actually works uh, in a non-exploitative uh, way and is respectful of people and the environment? And, uh, you know, I'd love suggestions from, from your listeners on yeah. what we could do uh, to make that one a reality. It's, a, it's the surprise of the uh, package of today and uh, it's the one which is really challenging. I suppose if all multinationals and big companies were obliged to disclose the profits they make and all these kind of deals and taxes, if they were obliged to, uh, what's called, that would be uh, that would be a phenomenal start because I think many people aren't aware. We, we hear about overseas aid, but you know the amount of money that we give in aid to developing countries is dwarfed by the amount of money that you know uh, multinationals are taking out of Africa every year through financial trickery and tax dodging. Um, and that's not even to talk about uh, the other you know ways in which basically there's about six times as much money leaves Africa as goes into uh, Africa by overseas aid. So we're actually being subsidized by Africans on a daily basis. So yes, I, I think that would be a really, you know, financial transparency and accountability of multinationals would be a big, big step towards a better world. If we had that, the aim of an economic system, it, uh, it, 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 would, it would be it really. Like, that's all we need, I suppose. It's a big, it's a big challenge, but that's all, that's the main thing we need globally as regards the business sector. Yeah, and I, I, you, you know, um, I was in Rio uh, last year um, and the private sector was asking for that actually. Mm-hmm. You know, there are bona fide companies who are seeing the problems that, that we are experiencing at, at a global scale stage and they are also wanting to contribute to solutions. It's not that they are the baddies necessarily. And, you know, there were companies there with saying, well, we want greater regulation uh, and greater clarity or transparency on how companies are inf- affecting the environment. And you could 
make it very tangible by just asking governments or con companies that are you know listed in Ireland and are availing of our low corporation tax that they ha have a certain minimum disclosure about what their impact on on poverty and environment for instance and, uh, or make it a condition for being listed on the stock exchange mm -hmm. those sort of things are not radical they are not um, you know calling for a whole new world over, over mm -hmm. order overnight but they are tangible they are practical and they would have a massive impact of, uh, on on poor people around the world Okay, Hans, it's been great talking to you and um, we'll keep in touch with you and um, uh, over the next few months, over the next couple of years, uh, while we prepare for the new Millennium Goal or the new uh, development goals to replace the Millennium Development Goals. So thanks, Hans, right?